Uh, welcome to this session. We'll be talking about uh, war reporting uh, with a view, uh, with a focus on, on the conflict in Syria. Uh, I'm Sikandar Karmani. I'm the, the BBC correspondent uh, covering Pakistan and Afghanistan. And I'll introduce the rest of the panel. Um, we have uh, Rania Abu Zaid, who is a, an award winning journalist who's reported from a long list of countries that it would take me too long to, to, to all name, but they include Syria, Iraq, Egypt, and here in Pakistan, I believe, uh, for outlets including The Guardian, uh, The New Yorker, Time, uh, and she's written a book, uh, No Turning Back, uh, which, uh, Life and Loss uh, and Life, Loss and Hope in Wartime Syria. It's a fantastic book that really uh, details the trajectory of, the, of the, the conflict, the uprising in Syria from the, its beginning in 2011 uh, through uh, to, to, to present day, more or less, uh, detailing um, how it changed from a peaceful revolution to an to a armed revolution uh, and the growing influence of Islamist groups as well and the group, groups such as Jabhat al-Nusra and ISIS. Uh, we also have uh, Osama uh, bin Javed, uh, who is a journalist with uh, Al Jazeera, who's uh, also reported from Syria and, and many other countries around the Middle East uh, and also previously was at Dawn News, I believe, in Pakistan and has recently been nominated for an Emmy Award for, for coverage of uh, the, the blockade in Qatar. And uh, Lali Snow, who's a, a photojournalist and a journalist <laughs> um, who has uh, covered uh, Afghanistan, uh, Ukraine, uh, the Palestinian territories in Israel, uh, I believe you will be talking about your own book uh, in a detailed session tomorrow, which also uh, contributed to a BBC documentary about uh, civilians in, in war-affected areas and how they uh, often look after gardens as a way of trying to re retain some semblance of, of peace and calm in their lives. Uh, I want to keep this session as interactive as possible, so we'll kick off with uh, uh, a bit of discussion here, and then uh, we'll open it up to, to, to questions. Uh, although with an emphasis on, on questions rather than comments and statements, if that's, if that's possible. Uh, so uh, the first question that I want to uh, turn to you, Rania, about is, is uh, you spent a great amount of time in Syria uh, from the beginning of the, of the uprising. Uh, you know, you faced uh, huge dangers in, in doing that. The, the people who were there obviously faced huge dangers as well. Uh, your book is a... a it has you know, many stories of endurance, but many stories of, of suffering. Uh, and I suppose I know in the book you were quite keen to, to minimize uh, your own role in, in, in your reporting, but was it a difficult decision for you to keep going back into a war zone, knowing that there were airstrikes around you, knowing that there's a, a threat of assassination? People you talk about in the book, some of them are, are subject to assassination attempts just moments after meeting you. Uh, and, Not related, and, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> so was it a difficult decision? To, and, 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 and was it difficult to move on from that trauma once you take yourself out of that situation as well? Thank you very much. Thank you for, uh, for being here. Thank you for your interest in this uh, subject. It's, I guess I should start by saying that I'm not an adrenaline junkie. I'm not... F entering these conflicts for, for any kind of a thrill. On the contrary, I don't even consider myself a war reporter, I'm not. I'm a reporter who covers the Middle East and I was also covering parts of uh, South Asia that happened to fall into conflict. When I first started covering Syria, I had covered uh, the uprising and the revolution in Tunis beforehand. From Tunis I went to Cairo and then I wanted to see what was, what was happening in Syria. So I made my way there in late February, and I happened uh, to cover some of the first protests in the capital, Damascus. So when I started, that, that was the scene. But once, I always knew that what was going to happen in Syria wasn't going to be contained to Syria, because whatever happened, if Syria changed in any way, it was going to impact, have, a, have an impact well beyond its borders, given its geostrategic importance. And that's what drew me back to the story time and time again. It's very difficult for us as journalists to see a story, to know there's a story out there and to not, not do it. Um, and I uh, was well aware of the, the, the threats. I was well aware of the, the dangers. I mean, I think that the problem is when you uh, don't consider the threats and you don't consider the dangers when you become so numb to covering things like this that you're not aware of the 
you're not able to, to realize just how dangerous it is. I think when you get to that point, you have to stop doing it because it means that you can't adequately assess the environment in which you're in and you can become a danger to yourself and to people around you. Um, so I was aware of, of that all the time, but I just, I, as a journalist, the story kept dr drawing me back. It wasn't any kind of like thrill-seeking, it was the story, and it was the people, and it was the importance of what was happening in Syria, and that's what drew me there. And having seen some of the images that you've seen, the, you know, the aftermath of airstrikes, the, uh, you know, the, the conflict in, in, in kind of close up, once you then removed yourself from the situation, once you went back home, was it hard to, to forget those images? Did you, did you struggle never with forget. Kind of, uh, the, the fact that you weren't there and people that you were close to were still there? Yeah, no, I never forget. Every, every person I've had the privilege to meet is imprinted in my memory. Um, that's just, I, I can't forget people uh, who, who I meet, and, and there are so many, many over the years. But for, for me, the act of, um, if I witness something, if I'm in a hospital when it's struck, or if I'm in a, I mean, on the road and the car in front of me is hit or something like that, I have seen this, but I am there for a reason. I'm there to record it, and I'm there to tell all of you about it. That's my job. And the act of recording and the act of, of uh, serving as a megaphone, really, so that all of you can see what I saw, so that this incident didn't just happen in isolation and then it was forgotten, that the blood was spilt has now been seen, not just by me, but by you as well. And that act of recording is in some ways cathartic because I know that um, that's my job and I've, and I've done it, at least for that day. And Lali, as, as a photojournalist, uh, you're often uh, capturing people at the worst moments of their lives uh, in hugely traumatic situations. It's obviously a hugely important job. That's how the world is informed about what's going on. But do you ever feel uncomfortable? Do you ever feel torn about whether you're to take an image or not? Yeah, completely. I think that's one of the hardest things about image making. Um, oh, can you hear me? No, maybe turn it on. Does that work? Yes. <laughs> I think that's one of the hardest things about being an image maker is that moral dilemma of whether you take the picture or do you stop and help. And if you're taking the picture, are you not just taking something from somebody, literally? And I think, as Rania said, it's your job, really, as a journalist, um, to tell the world. And it is your place to report and to show people what's going on. Um, but I, th I sort of think that if, unless, you know, if someone is obviously bleeding to death in your arms, practically, then I think it's your job as a human being. And it doesn't matter if you're an accountant or a journalist. You've got to help. I think that's the, the, the bottom line. Uh, and Osama, I know you've, uh, as well as being a journalist, you've, you've, done, you've carried out relief work. You've worked with, with, uh, with uh, <coughs> victims of, of earthquakes and, and, and floods. Um, when you're a journalist, how difficult is it to, to draw that line between uh, getting involved in the story and helping people out who are in dire need or, or retaining your, your distance and, and, and not getting involved and just documenting it? Well, I think that's very important because you're there to, to tell the world about that story without being part of that story. And it is, it is a very fine line in doing relief work and telling people about what to do. Um, and there have been multiple instances where I've seen firsthand. It was a New Year's Eve. We were in a, in a camp, um, freezing conditions, and children were walking barefoot. And people saw that report. People saw us live throughout the day from... And there was such an outpour um, of people who wanted to help and support. So I think that's, that's what gives us the, the strength to carry on because inherently, as much as the, the violence that surrounds you and, and, the, and the negativity that, that we report on, what it brings out is the good in people. You see those stories, and, and Rania speaks about hope as well. Uh, on March the 15th, it will be eight years of the Syrian conflict. Um, people who like me and, and Rani and others who've been covering this conflict day in and day out, we, we find it really hard to see hope. But that is until you sit down with a Syrian who opens up their heart. I was, I was just a couple of weeks ago sitting down with a seven-year-old girl who lost uh, her mother, her brother, um, and a leg in, in an airstrike. And I met her after three years. So I've seen that transformation. 
that the, that the, that the flame of hope is, is still alive. She does have the sparkle in her eye. She does look forward. And despite all of the conditions that she faces, she does cry about it. But that at the end of the day, it's not what uh, describes her, her overall condition. And I think that is what gives us as journalists uh, both the stamina um, as well as the conviction to continue to do our job as people who tell the story rather than becoming the story ourselves. And, and Rani, in your book, you, you narrate an experience where uh, an activist who's become a, a kind of close source of yours starts seeking help from you. He says, oh, who can you connect me with? Can you connect me with influential politicians? Can you get me uh, garments? <laughs> exactly. Which yeah. is beyond the remit, certainly, most people would say, of, of general journalism. Yeah. But is it hard to, uh, to explain to people who are living in conflict zones the limits that you can go to to help them? Or, or, or is, it, is it clear enough for them that this, this is all you can do. You can tell the world that you can't get involved yourself. No, I, I have to make that clear. I have to make that clear. Um, you, you're referring to an, a case where an activist um, would often contact me in the early hours of the morning and ask me to, if you know, I could get him, literally, if I can get him weapons or if I could connect him to people who could. And you have to make that clear. And once I, in my experience, once I've made that clear, um, then those questions stop and they realize. I tell them, this is what I can do. I am, I'm here to to tell your story, to verify it, and that's my role. I'm not here as an aid worker, I'm not here as a, as a weapons smuggler, um, I'm not here as anything else. This is my role and this is what I can do and I can't do more than that. But as a human being, obviously, you know, I mean, we'll, we'll hold the hands of, of kids who are crying in hospitals and things like that. I mean, that, you know, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a human first and then, then I'm a journalist, but, but there are certain things which are absolute red lines which I uh, will not and cannot cross. Providing RPGs is, is, one, for, of those, for example, one, yeah. is one of those red lines, I imagine. Uh, Lali, I'm sure you've never been asked to provide anyone with RPGs necessarily, but have there been moments where you've been tempted to, to put down the camera and, and uh, help someone rather than, rather than take the shot? Or is it take the shot and then help someone? How does it work? Well, fortunately, I've never been in that situation. But people often, especially working in Afghanistan and Gaza, people see me and think I must be some kind of aid worker or a doctor because I'm, I'm Anglo-Saxon. So it's quite hard to, especially in hospitals um, in northern Afghanistan, it seems to happen all the time, but it's quite hard to just explain that, no, I'm, I'm just here to report on what's going on. But it, depending on which conflict you're working in, it really sort of depends on how people kind of accept that. So someone like... Uh, Afghanistan where media is still you know it's pretty new um, after so much conflict and it's still quite respected it ends up being a little bit easier I guess to explain but um, in somewhere like Gaza where there's just been such a saturation of reporting and journalism coming out of there for decades it's it's, it's harder for people to accept that you're a journalist because they see journalists coming and going all the time and nothing changes for people in Gaza. So that's, it's, it's a challenge in that respect. But fortunately, no weapons dealing. <laughs> um, and, and that's one of the things that comes out in, in Rania's book is, as well is, is the, the sense of hope that many people in Syria had at the start of the conflict that by uh, journalists documenting the atrocities, the human rights abuses that are going on there, that there would be perhaps some kind of international action. One of the kind of refrains that you hear from people is, surely people will come and help. Mm. Um, and, and as the, the conflict goes on, it becomes clearer, to, certainly to, to uh, international observers and I think to, to the people in Syria, that that help isn't really going to come or it's not coming in the form that they, they want it to come in. Uh, so once that realization happens, does that affect how people relate to you uh, on the ground? And does it affect how you think about your own reporting and, and what you're really achieving? Um, yeah, very much so. Um, in the beginning, when I first started covering Syria, people used to think that uh, they, they were keen to talk to me. They thought that the world didn't know what was happening in Syria, and they wanted to, to get that information out. And after a while, it became harder. People w would say things like, why should I bother? It became clear that the world knew what was happening, it just didn't seem to care. And it became harder. People would, would often tell me in, in interviews, like, why should I talk to you? Why? And I remember once there was, and sometimes it could get dangerous, it could put me in, in you know, I mean, it could get really heated. I remember once um, I was in a town and there was a, 
an airstrike and it was a horrific, like dozens of people were killed and, and um, it was just a ferocious airstrike on a town and uh, a lot of civilians were killed and there were armed uh, battalions of the Free Syrian Army there and they were coming into the hospital as well and they saw me in the hospital with my notepad and pen. So I went to talk to them and they got very angry, like, why are you here? You journalists, all you do is like come here and you take our stories, well, how are you helping us, what are you doing? And I knew that I had to, I couldn't argue with them, this man was hurt, these men were hurt, they were um, hyped up and they were um, really angry about what was happening. So I just very calmly said, listen, you know I can't do anything except for for report and, and tell the world what's happening here. I'm here with you. I saw what happened. I'm trying to get the story out. What do you want the world to know? And, you know, sometimes that, that, would, uh, that would help because I, I was there with them and we were there with them. Uh, you know, we, we weren't, uh, I don't know, uh, maybe if we were phoning in, it might have been a, a different reaction uh, for, from some people. But. Um, but that tended to sort of, you know, mitigate the circumstances. They knew that we were there with them and that we were just trying to do our jobs. And Osama, you've been reporting on, on Syria for a number of years as well. Is, is this, uh, has there been a change uh, that you've noticed in the way that people react to journalists coming in and, and asking them about their experiences? Absolutely. Uh, because in the last eight years, the Syrian conflict has morphed. It is not the same Syria that we entered uh, in 2011. It is not the same Syria that we entered in 2015. Mm. It depends on where you're going into Syria, uh, whether you're crossing it from the Iraqi border, whether you're crossing it from the, from the Turkish border, where you're trying to get access from the Jordanian or the Lebanese border. So a lot has changed in the last eight years, and it has had an impact uh, on the expectations of people as well. Because as, as Rania said, initially, people were very outspoken. They were very keen. They wanted to come and tell you their stories. But now you go and whether it's, it's right after an airstrike or, or, or a massive shelling attack or whether it's a refugee camp. I remember we were at a refugee camp in Aleppo countryside where people had fled from Homs. And there was a little boy who wanted to speak to us. And we went in and we asked the mother for permission. And she said, absolutely not. I'm not going to allow you to use my child to sell your journalism. Really? And that was, that, was, that was a really stark reality which struck us at, at that point that we are being seen as voyeurs and who come in and document this and nothing happens. And people have a certain expectation that once I tell you my story, somebody somewhere will listen to it. And that is a constant struggle that we face as well, especially for a prolonged conflict like Syria, um, is every deployment you come back and you ask yourself the question that, you know, was it worth it? Did it make an impact? You know, I, the world knows about this. I mean, I was covering the fall of Aleppo, and people were screaming at the top of their lungs from all media networks, um, and we we were struggling to show pictures and, and not to sh what not to show because you don't want to sanitize the war, but you don't want to put people off watching telly as well. So it is a constant struggle for journalists to tell that story. And how do you reconcile it with yourself? I mean, do you come back then and think? it was worth it or do you, are, are there moments of doubt where you think actually perhaps you know what we're doing isn't helping enough? Well I think that moment of doubt I, I don't know about others but I've, I've always you know gr grappled with it. Um, I had a very frank discussion with, with the director of news and I actually there was if you cover it for so long and there are stories that really impact you as a human being then you do ask yourself that question and we had this very frank discussion and I said you know what half a million people dead it's been seven years. What impact did we do? And in that discussion, the thing came out was that, now imagine if we weren't every single day hammering on the people who control the powers, the powers that be, if we weren't hammering with them with those images, with that information that you are killing people, that we know that you're committing war crimes. Imagine if it wasn't that, and the death toll could have been two million or more. Mm -hmm. and Rania, one of the, the, the main kind of issues that people now associate with the Syrian conflict, which of course started as a, as a peaceful uh, protest movement, is of course the growth of, of, of ISIS, of Daesh. Uh, and certainly in uh, Western media, uh, the, the, a lot of the focus that has been given to the conflict in Syria has been through that lens, uh, about the growth of ISIS and about the threat that it poses uh, to, to Western countries. 
did you find people in Syria who were frustrated by that? Because, of course, uh, many more people, uh, according to, to kind of most data, have been killed by, by the Syrian regime than have been killed by, by extremist groups, despite, of course, their obvious uh, brutality. Well, I'd say that um, the other thing about this uh, issue is the fact that uh, Islamic State killed many more Syrians and Iraqis and Muslims than it did Europeans or Americans or anybody else. And that is something that is, I, th I feel is lost in the debate when we focus on the Western victims of Islamic State and we uh, don't pay attention to the fact that it is so massively skewed in terms of the numbers. Uh, they killed many more uh, people in the countries where they were present. And this was something that uh, I think was missing from, from, from the coverage. I mean, we can even see now the, the rush to talk to foreign ISIS wives, Islamic State wives. Um, you know, they, they were like a novelty, I guess, in some ways, relative to... to, to I, I, I saw a tweet from, from one terrorism researcher today saying he thinks the ratio to ISIS fighters to journalists in northern Syria right now is one to one. <laughs> <laughs> because... Uh, uh, many Western journalists, understandably Perhaps. so, uh, are, are, are trying to, to plug interviews out of the refugee camps. Yeah, no, I mean, that's understandable, and it's a very difficult situation, and, you, and uh, you know, they're there, and it's, and it's very hard. Um, so, it's, you know, my hat's off to them. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I watched the rise of these groups in, um, in Syria, and it, it was clear, it was obvious. I mean, I remember in, uh, tw so in 2014, when uh, the group that was then called ISIS was declared, uh, 2013, sorry, 2014, when they declared this, their so-called caliphate, I remember doing a lot of media and some of the journalists said, well, where did this group suddenly come from? It didn't suddenly come from anywhere. It was always there. We were reporting it. We were showing the rise of these uh, extremists inside Syria. We were showing what they were doing to, to Syrians. Um, and this group was, of course, you know, not the first time that we'd seen it. It was just the most recent incarnation of the group that was formed after the 2003 U.S.-led invasion of Iraq. It has been known by many names, but the seed is the same. And, uh, you know, in the same way now that we're seeing it being reduced back to a very small, hardcore group of fighters that will no doubt, once again, re-emerge from that seed in some form uh, in the future. But, um, but yeah, no, so... so uh, it was a bit frustrating to, to see the emphasis on, on the, the Western victims of Islamic State and not also look at uh, the broader picture. It's the same with the refugee crisis. We hear about the European refugee crisis precipitated by the Syrian uh, war. But uh, the, the, the crisis is in Syria's neighboring states. It's in Jordan, which is a water-parched country which is now sharing its uh, meager resources with hundreds of thousands of Syrians. It's in Turkey, which hosts almost four million refugees, the largest uh, refugee population in the world. It's in Lebanon, where at one point every fourth person was a Syrian. That's where the refugee crisis is. But once again, the coverage tends to get skewed, at least in the English language media. And Lali, when, when it comes to your work, do you find it uh, difficult at times to get a news outlet interested in, in international news? Are they, is there often a, a big focus on what's going on domestically within, within countries, <clears throat> despite <throat> the kind of awful stories that you're, you're trying to cover? Completely. It's, um, it's, it's a real challenge. I've, I've never worked for anyone. I've always been freelance. Um, and working in, in, well, for five years in Afghanistan, it was really tough towards the end to make people, to, to get editors interested in what was going on. And the war still rumbles on in Afghanistan. It hasn't gone anywhere. It's just that we don't have troops there, so the Western media, the British media, isn't that interested. And it's, it's a real challenge to kind of make people at home be interested because, you know, the UK is in dire straits at the moment with Brexit, falling economy, political instability. People don't really care about what's happening in Syria, Yemen, Afghanistan, Myanmar. So it's, it's such a challenge to engage people. And I live in a really rural area of England in a village of 300 people between two towns, one pretty affluent and one not very affluent. And if I go to either town and try and ask people what they think about what's going on in Afghanistan or Syria or anywhere, they're not really interested. And it's, it's, I don't know whether that's... I don't know whether that's uh, the British sort of um, fascination with celebrity, um, with ego, or whether it's just the crumbling media in institutions, but it is permanently a challenge. And um, one, one is always under scrutiny as well by, um, by your peer group, I suppose, internationally, to see what you're doing. And that, that's another challenge as well. 
Well, look, why don't we open it up to a, a, a few questions? Uh, take this gentleman, gentleman here. Uh, there's a microphone. Can you reach it? Uh, my name is Ahmad Hussain. Um, you are, all three of you are storytellers. It's a horrible story, Syria. Um, consider that we are children sitting here and you're telling a story. Um, every story has a lesson. What do you think, what's your take, what's the lesson from the Syrian conflict till date? Oh, big question. <laughs> Uh, Rani, do you want to take it, take it on first? The lesson of the Syrian conflict. Uh, there, are, there are many lessons. It depends on the audience. Um, I think that uh, in terms of international relations, it will be a lesson in the... What's the word I'm looking for? How some laws are only on paper and not in practice. How prohibitions against chemical weapons mean nothing based on what we've seen happen in Syria with the repeated use of, of banned weapons. Um, I think uh, it, it, it'll be a, it, it's a case study in the power of the veto at the UN Security Council and uh, you know, what, um, what we can become numb to, what we as people can become numb to if our leaders are making all sorts of other, have other reasons for ignoring things, what about us? as people. I mean, you know, charities like uh, all sorts of NGOs and, and the United Nations are always uh, crying about their lack of funding for the Syria uh, relief effort. What about us as people if, if, if it doesn't move us to, to at least try and do something uh, by donating to, to these uh, organizations? Uh, as journalists, I think there are many lessons as well in terms of how to, uh, you know, as, as Syria became increasingly difficult to get into, and our colleagues were kidnapped and many of them were killed in gruesome, gruesome ways. Um, understandably, many people started reporting from a distance. So there are questions that we need to have as an industry about how to cover a conflict from a distance, how to verify information on social media, which is coming from people who are often, you know, um, using names that are completely anonymous and we aren't even really sure where they are. So how do we, how do we go about doing our work when it becomes too dangerous to be in the place that we're covering. So there are many different lessons based on who is the audience for those, uh, for those lessons. Uh, Osama, do you have anything to add on that, particularly on, on this issue of verification? Because um, as Rani has said, the Syria conflict saw these terrible, target, deliberate targeting of, uh, of journalists uh, in a very high-profile way, and it meant that many news organizations uh, were really very reluctant to go uh, into many parts of Syria, certainly to have people going in there for any kind of extended amount of time because they didn't want to ex expose their journalists to the risk. That means that you're, uh, as Rania says, you're dealing with people perhaps by Skype or WhatsApp, uh, people that you, uh, uh, who clearly have at least some kind of, uh, of uh, agenda, even if it's a benign agenda, but how do you then uh, deal with that and, and work, remain objective and try and verify the information uh, without being able to get there yourself at times to the, to the affected areas? Well, I think before I begin, I think the, the biggest lesson here is that we need to remind ourselves constantly uh, that the conflict in Syria is not over. Mm. The Islamic State might have crumbled, but that was just one factor of that very, very gruesome conflict. We have watched half a million people die in slow motion on live TV, mm -hmm. essentially. Mm -hmm. And we've, we've got to remind ourselves of that, that the suffering for millions and millions of Syrians inside Syria and outside Syria is not over. So that's lesson number one. Number two, the point of, of verification. How do you verify that information? Uh, there was a point after 2014 for about three years that I couldn't enter Syria. We just wouldn't be able to as much as we wanted to. We were going in with smugglers, we were going in with people who we did not know. We, were, we did not know whether we would be kidnapped by the people who were taking us in or would they be selling us to one group or the other. So it became very hairy, so we couldn't go in. But during that time, in, because we've been, I'd been working on Syria for, for a number of years beforehand, I had all of those contacts in local committees, activists, journalists, coffee sellers who became FSA fighters. Um, 
And we saw that, that you know, those Skype contacts, one after the other, started going dark as well. Uh, in Aleppo, there was one building collapse which killed three of the people um, who I used to get information verified with. So as the conflict prolongs itself, it, it becomes harder and harder. Uh, but you cannot, uh, and I think that's the mistake that a lot of journalists, and, and there's a lot of lack of faith in journalism because of, because of the speed of that everything is happening now and it needs to be reported right now. Uh, there have been a lot of compromises that have been made by journalists amongst ourselves on the verification of, of stories, verification of news. Um, and that has led to the rise of this so-called fake news um, crutches, so to speak, that people can come out and say that, oh, Huta was, was fake, it was, it was staged, it was actors. Um, but we know that we saw those lifeless bodies without wounds. We saw those mass graves of 130-odd children um, who, who, had, who, who just as, asphyxiated um, because of chlorine gas. Um, so those are the kind of things that I think uh, a lot of emphasis needs to be built on, like Rania said, on how we do this business. And our only sources that are reliable are the people who we know, people who we trust, uh, not a YouTube account or a Twitter handle. Um, it has to be with how much effort and energy and time have you put into place to build those contacts. And a, a lot of mistakes are made once you realize that those, that didn't exist or was ignored. And then, Lali, because of some of these dangers that uh, journalists face going into conflict zones, whether it's Syria, whether it's Afghanistan, often uh, many news organizations decide the only way to do it is if you're uh, doing what's called an embed. If you're uh, going in with a force, whether that's the rebels, whether it's the British Army, uh, and of course that gives you access to areas that potentially you wouldn't be able to access otherwise. But at the same time, then you're spending a lot of time and your safety is dependent on, on one party in the conflict. So how, I know that you've, uh, I think, spent some time with, with the British Army in, in, in Afghanistan. How difficult is it to uh, retain your objectivity and your distance from the subject when you're spending so much time with them there? It's certainly a challenge, um, whether you're working with the Brits, the Americans, the French, whichever, because you become, you know, you're reliant on these people for your security in a very dangerous environment. And you also, you build a, a rapport with the people you spend a lot of time with. But I think objectivity is something that, if you're a journalist, you, it's, it's innate in you. You just have to be able to step back. And I think that you know, you, you, trying not to be partisan or biased is a challenge. And I think that's where I was going to talk about a lesson, actually. My lesson would be empathy and a plea for empathy. Because however much time I've spent with you know, US, UK forces, I've also spent time with the Taliban in southern Afghanistan. And you can go in and think, well, you know, whatever you think about the Taliban and what they've done to the country, but then actually spend time speaking to them and a different dialogue emerges and a different conversation emerges. And you might not think personally whether it's right or wrong, but there's, there's a, a clearer understanding and it creates empathy just by discussing things with both sides. And I think that's, that's key to, to, to any kind of war reporting. Uh, let's take another question. Uh, take this uh, lady with the grey scarf. Yeah, next to the microphone. Sure. Hi. Um, I worked in emergency crisis management for almost five years between uh, Palestine and Egypt and Syria and then Afghanistan. And I'm wondering, so I've been out of the field now for almost three years, but I'm wondering as journalists what it's like for you to present the need for like neat narratives in the aftermath of conflict, especially when you're reporting, and not just while you're reporting, but even in your personal lives when you are reflecting on conflict, like what's it like to, to not be embedded, right? Like if you think about Sebastian Junger or Tim Hetherington who went to the Kerangal Valley and they were embedded and then they made Restrepo, that was a very different story than Marie Colvin and, and Holmes and, and sort of the narrative that's come out more recently in, in the, you know, that feature length film and so like, I'm struck by your insistence on hope, and I'm skeptical of it too, as someone who was on the ground and who refuses to talk about it now. And so I was just wondering if, from a journalistic perspective, you could speak to that. I, um, I question whether I should have that word in the subtitle of the book. And I decided on it because the hope is not from me. It's not about me seeing hope. It's about the people in the book, some of them seeing hope. And I figure if they haven't given up, how dare I? So it comes from them. 
Well, I, I would say that I would say that hope is, uh, and you'd be surprised to know that every Syrian that you meet wants to go back home. Mm. They might not have anything to return to, mm. but they want to go back. So the, you would be interviewing a father who's lost six children, a wife, an uncle, and a, and a brother, and his home has been destroyed. But when you, on that last question of what do you think, what is the future for you, he said, you know what? After a couple of years, I'd like to rebuild my life. I would like to go back home. So that hope actually, and uh, I've, I've covered conflict from Afghanistan um, to, to other places, uh, but there is, there's a lot of, it, it, it is difficult to express in words, but the Syrians are, are different people. Um, they, would, they would say, alhamdulillah, and, and, and all of that, while they're describing their pain and their suffering. Um, so that hope is, is there. Uh, the question is that should we continue to ignore it because doing a hopeful story uh, doesn't get picked up by, yeah. by newspapers. It doesn't give you the clicks or, or the likes. It doesn't make the headlines. And that is the constant fight. You, you spoke about um, fatigue of the conflict. It's not just amongst people. It's amongst newsrooms as well. Editors in newsrooms, you, you, once, if it's only four people dead, it doesn't make the headlines. And that is something that we constantly have to grapple with. So that hope actually does drive us to go back to that story, to continue to tell that story of the people who shouldn't be discarded by the rest of the world as, too bad, this happened, let's move on. And that is, that is the, the essence of what we do, is that bringing out the stories of these people to an international audience, it, it does two things. One, it creates that empathy, that human connection. Uh, that this is somebody who is just like me, you know. When, when, when a mother tells you that they were on the rooftop playing when a mortar hit them, it, you, can, you can relate to it, that, you know, you do play with your children or your cousins or your, or, or your family. So one is empathy, and the other is that their suffering is not over. As human beings of this connected global village, there is a certain responsibility that all of us share. And that collective responsibility is about caring for the people who are around us, who may be distant, but they're still suffering. And I think that is, that is the essence of hope and the message that we try to give with, with telling stories of people. And, and Lali, a lot, of, a lot of your work is about people retaining yeah. a semblance of karma or normality amidst the, all the suffering. Well, yeah, in latter years, um, I became rather um, inured to suffering and became rather numb to it in, in Afghanistan. And I ended up trying to find personal solace through the means of, of gardens because when I lived where I lived in Afghanistan, we all had lovely gardens and it was a real escape from the world outside and the, the, the reality of what was going on outside. And the more I looked and the more I spent time with people in various parts of the country, the more I saw that it was a universal thing. They too were trying to escape their reality by gardening. And obviously gardens have a practical sense. They can um, provide food and shade and beauty at the same time in therapy. And I took this to other countries and found a very, very similar story in Gaza, in the West Bank, in Ukraine. Um, and I know that there are other countries where I couldn't quite get there, um, where the same thing is, is happening. And, it's, and it is really about hope. So in answer to your question, I think you were embedded with your own work as much as we have been with ours. And it, it's having the ability to step back and to see beauty and calm in very small things. And the people of Syria, and they say, Alhamdulillah, and that they are believing in that, that, that there is something that will drive them forward, take the human spirit forward, because without hope, then there's no future, really. Thank you. Uh, this gentleman here, is there a microphone? There are uh, hands up there. My name is Shahid Hassan. I think the end game is there in Syria. What sort of a future do you foresee for Syria in the geopolitical context? <laughs> okay. This is a, I think you're all looking at each other question, for that one. But let's, let's see if we can condense this. I mean, well, I mean, I think that the, you know, as uh, as my colleague said, the war isn't over yet. We have to remember that it's not over. But the outcome of the war is clear at this point. Assad has won. His, um, he and his allies have won. So that remains intact. That system remains intact. 
um, and uh, you know his alliance with the, the Russians and the Iranians and Lebanese Hezbollah is, the, is one of the key reasons for his uh, victory in Syria. Um, the other side lost, the, the Saudis, the Qataris, the Gulfis, uh, Turkey, although Erdogan is uh, maneuvering. Uh, you know, the, the, the West lost in Syria. Simple as that. We, can we, if we just, uh, sorry, sir, we just, just one question for the moment. Can you just move on to the, the lady in black? Um, just. First of all, thank you. Because, um, I want to draw your attention to the link between. Uh, trauma. If there's a microphone, by. Between trauma that conflict always brings, not just for the victims, but also for those who are on the opposite side. And what effect does that have on those who are reporting and those who are uh, carrying out their duty, as the case may be in yours? There is an entire body of work that tells us that trauma suffered by a people lingers on and is carried forward through generations. So while the war may have an finite time, it may come to an end at some point, but the memory of it is retained in the cells of the, of the people and handed over to their next generation. So the effect is far more uh, in both time and space than we are fully aware of. So I wanted to know whether this aspect um, is something that uh, is uh, in your radar, do you think about it, um, do you report about it? And Perhaps there should be more attention given to it because of the enduring quality that trauma retains. Thank you. No, thank you for your question. It's, uh, it's one that is increasingly, um, I'm increasingly interested in. We often follow the quote-unquote bang-bang of the war, uh, the dynamic period, but then what happens after? And often the, the media moves on. Um, all of that trauma that you talked about, the trauma that is passed on from person to person is, is very important and it's key. And I think what happens with that, if it stops there and if there is healing, depends on how the conflict ends. It depends on if there is accountability. It depends on if there is a sense of justice. It depends on if there is any information about the, the tens of thousands of missing, of the disappeared, if there is any form of closure. Um, I doubt that any of that is going to happen in Syria. It doesn't seem to be the case. It didn't happen in Lebanon, where I'm from, where, where the place of my heritage before. So those hatreds and those tensions, they simmer. They simmer at, at a lower temperature, almost ensuring a future rupture at some point, because as you said, th those uh, feelings are often passed on from generation to generation. But I'm increasingly interested in these post-conflict societies and how they reform, if at all. On a neighborly level, how do people who were uh, fighting each other, killing each other at one point, come to, back to a, an area if they do? Or does the, the demography of, of the place change almost permanently in some way? So they're all important questions that I think we need to um, consider, editors permitting, of course, because they're the gatekeepers and they prefer the bang bang and the, uh, the dynamism of conflict. But I think that they're very important questions that need to be addressed. And I, if I could, sorry, just, just add to that. I think there's that question, you could bring it home to the Pakistani audience right now. Because there's a lot of war hysteria that is happening right now. There's a lot of proponents for war that you, these so-called keyboard warriors that you, that you see who are pro-war, who've never seen war, who've never seen suffering, who've never seen the impact of war. And I think that kind of is, is the gist of our, our work as well, that we try and get to give people that this is the suffering that happens during, but what comes after. I was at a, at a, uh, at a center which makes uh, armed limbs for, 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 for Syrians. When I met them four years ago, they had 300 cases. Right now, after the conflict has subsided, they have 2,000 cases. When the war normalizes, people need to move on with their lives. When they need to move on their, with their lives, they need those limbs to survive. And that's just a physical aspect. Now imagine those children in their millions who've seen their parents being blown to bits. That's something that will never leave them. Uh, and Lali, we were talking about the Syrian conflict, which has of course gone on for, for seven years now. We talk about the conflict in Afghanistan, 
that's gone on even longer. That's, it's a 17-year-old war, uh, yeah. preceded by decades of conflict, really. Yeah. Uh, th- you know, when I go to Afghanistan, I often think this is a country where the entire nation, more or less, must have some kind of form yeah. of a post-traumatic stress disorder. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Is, is that something that, that, you're, that, that comes across to you when you're, when you're working there? Completely, but I think perhaps almost more shocking is how normalized it, it is, and it's, it's, it's quite ordinary and commonplace for someone just to say, oh, well, their family's from Kunduz, and they were blown up in a very blasé way. And you, when you actually think about the statistics and what's actually happened, it's horrific. I've actually done quite a lot of research into post-traumatic stress disorder, Um, amongst troops returning home. And I think um, the lessons that have been learned, well, not learned there, can be taken to to people in Gaza and Syria, especially children. Um, And I remember in 2009, after the war there, there was, um, I spoke to a child psychologist, and they they were basically crying out for child psychologists to go to Gaza because there were so many children. I think it's a very young population anyway. I think half the population is under the age of 20. But they were crying out for psychologists to go and help these children who'd just, you know, who'd just been very badly hit over the course of, I think the war was only three and a half weeks long. But it's a sustained attack in, in Gaza, I suppose. And I think um, one of the interesting things that came out about some research I did it was how post-traumatic stress disorder can be fostered and nurtured depending on where you come from and how susceptible you are to it. And I wonder, it's, it's, I'm just wondering if there's a link between perhaps people who are around it all the time, people who are brought up in a, in a world where trauma is commonplace versus people who have come from somewhere completely ex- outside and their ability to cope. But then, um, I don't know, I've never experienced um, uh, my family being you know, hurt or, or, or attacked or anything. Um, but I think that it's certainly, an, I think it's an issue that should be addressed more and more and more. It, it should be part and parcel of, of, of the story of like how people are actually, how the civilians are affected by conflict and what can be done to alleviate their suffering post-conflict. Uh, go to this gentleman here. Yeah. Uh, Sorry, I have a question. A microphone that can. There's a microphone up there in the gym with uh, a question. Good afternoon. Okay, everyone. we'll come to you next. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My question is: Why do you think that how much the global powers have played their part in spoiling the situation in war-torn countries, and why it is not disclosed before the general public in simple words that what are American interest, what are Russian interest in Syria or somewhere else? So so I think the question there was about uh, international powers, their role in conflicts like Syria, uh, and and partly how difficult is it to to get that information across, because it's it's somewhere like Syria becomes a a, a bit of a a, a global battlefield, doesn't it? But there's so many players that at times it can be confusing translating that to an audience who's perhaps reading the newspaper over their morning coffee. Well, I'll, I'll talk about television. So if I have a, a minute to talk about what has happened, let's say in northern Syria when Trump is pulling out troops, I have to describe that this is an area which is held by the Kurds who are backed by the Americans, who've been fighting for the Americans but are trying to make inroads towards the Assad regime, while Turkey is trying to make inroads against them, which is also an American ally, in a war where Turkey is also fighting the Russians. So, and now having to say that out loud... I think that took about a minute already, didn't it? (laughs) (laughs) So that is a very, very complicated conflict. And that's why I think a a lot of interest that has uh, sort of veered off is because how complicated Mm. it has become, how complicated these global powers have made this conflict. The the, the point that uh, was made earlier that Assad has won is because he won the war of narratives. It said, it's me or the terrorists. And by killing everything in between, it is between him and the terrorists now, and the powers that support him. Russia has a very different stake in Syria. The Americans have a very completely opposite stake. But at times, they're also talking to each other and have common interests as well. So I think for for a global audience, you can't just dip in and out of that story. For a conflict like Syria, because it is so complicated, because it has so many dimensions, and after ISIL, it entered Iraq as well. So you go into the Iraqi territory and the Kurds are very different from the from the Syrian Kurds, and it's the same group of people. So you have to follow it, and I think it's a constant challenge for us as well 
to try and explain and, and, and condense that information into, into bullet points, which I would find it very, very hard to do. Well, I suppose it's one of the advantages of being able to write a book. You have slightly more than a minute in which uh, to, no, to explain. No, but I, that's the thing. I thought that with a book I'd have more space. I don't. I, I, need, like, I needed more. I, uh, I initially wrote 180,000 words, which freaked my editor out because he was like, nobody's going to read a 600-page <laughs> book about Syria. So I cut out 60,000 words from it, and it's still huge, but uh, not enough space. Still more stories to tell. Uh, could you take this uh, lady with the yeah, microphone there? Um, hi, I'm Rupshi Ahmed. I'm a journalist and a published author. Uh, my question to you is that a lot of um, analysts, when they're talking about Middle East and Iraq especially, they, um, and specifically talking about human stories, they describe people going through a state of amnesia um, as to not remembering what Iraq was like before the invasion. So, um, <clears throat> Do you think when we're writing about Middle East and Syria, um, addressing that particularly would be the first step of spreading a wave of optimism and sort of um, help with the reconstruction of a society which could sort of, um, you know, could be sort of self-sufficient and could grow from there on because we need to build a narrative of, you know, what Syria was like before the war, what happened during the war and how could they come back to it. So sort of addressing um, how the situation wasn't exactly terrible before the war started could be the first step to reconstructing the society. Well, I think uh, there'd be some in Syria who, who would strongly dis disagree with that and, and would think that the conditions before the war, uh, before the, the, the revolution uh, started, would be uh, were, were the fundamental drivers uh, uh, for it. But, but perhaps it does touch upon uh, kind of Im countries' imagined pasts uh, and, uh, and collective consciousnesses within, within communities because what we saw, what comes out in your book is that a lot of the communities that, that uh, were, were some of the first to, to rise up uh, weren't just rising up because of the conditions then, they were rising up because of what had happened to their, their grandparents, their parents. Uh, is that something that, that kind of... Uh, that you think played a big role in the conflict in Syria, and is it easy to, yeah, not to explain just the, that? Not just the conflict in Syria. I mean, the Middle East is a place where history isn't past. It is present. It lives. It is remembered, uh, for better or worse. Uh, but that's just a fact. So it's, um, it, it's never in the distant past. It continues into the future, and that was definitely, um, for, for some participants in the Syrian uprising, that was foremost in their minds. And I'm thinking, uh, for example, of uh, uh, men who came to be Islamists who still remembered what had happened in the 1980s when Bashar's father and predecessor, Hafiz al-Assad, crushed an earlier Islamist insurrection against the Muslim Brotherhood. Some of those men who were children at the time, one of them is in my book, um, you know, witnessed uh, an older generation that was humiliated and defeated and carried that hurt, as the lady said, the trauma that was passed from generation to generation. They carried that hurt and that humiliation with them and they waited for an opportunity to almost take revenge. Um, so history has never passed. This gentleman has been waiting to ask a question for a while. Here's your chance, sir. Can you speak up a bit louder or is there any way to get a microphone over here? Sure. Do you want to, if, you, if I could hurry you along, because we don't have much time now. What, what's the kind of fundamental question? Osama, I think you're, you're, you, you, you t thank you for your question, sir. Osama, I think you, I think you, you wanted to touch upon this, and, and we talked about this earlier. 
Well, I'm, I'm glad that you that Thank you find that informative. Um, I think the chemical weapons is is not just journalists reporting it now. It's been the OPCW has confirmed the use of chemical weapons. The Syrian regime admitted that it has chemical weapons, and that's why there was uh, there was a team which went there and destroyed those chemical weapons. So it is not uh, as as skeptics on social media and other propaganda platforms would like you to question. Yes, it, so. There has been a use of chemical weapons. Now, the majority of the chemical weapons use has been from the Syrian government side. But there have been incidents where it has been fired by some rebel groups, including ISIL. Uh, and those were in, during the time where it was very difficult to enter Syria, so there weren't independent reports of that available. But instances which happen in Ghouta, in Hula, in Homs, in, in uh, Aleppo countryside, in Idlib countryside, in Idlib city, there have been multiple incidents. And it was, uh, and we, we initially, we did question that why would a government kill its own people indiscriminately? And the answer to that by many analysts was that this chemical weapons, if you look at the trajectory of the Syrian war, usually come right towards the end or end game of taking over a city uh, where, where rebels have been resisting. And that's that's been more or less the tra track of the Syrian government. So and yes, Osama, it, it, it kind of, I suppose we can say that there's all, there will always be skeptics oh, absolutely. To, 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 despite this. Look, we, we're running out of time, so I just want to pose, uh, thank you, sir, you had, your, you had your question. So we've got one last question I want to pose to, to each of you, is that going into war zones, you see humanity at its worst. What do you learn about evil? Because what we've seen, uh, in places like Syria is, is perhaps some of the most brutal acts that we've seen uh, of our lifetimes. What do you learn, you've met people who are responsible or involved certainly in these acts. What do you learn about the human capacity for evil? Uh, I don't know, evil is a strong word, um, but uh, you know, certainly people with these horrid intentions exist. They're not aliens. Uh, you'd be surprised by some of their backgrounds. They seem relatively, quote unquote, normal relatively um, successful in their lives. It's a fallacy to think that many of them are, um, you know, poor men with no prospects. That isn't the case. Um, yes, we see the worst of humanity, but sometimes we also see the best. Sometimes we see people who um, have almost superhuman resilience, not just uh, for themselves personally, but also for their friends and family and neighbors. So um, we see humanity at its most extreme across the spectrum. And just a quick word from, from yourself, Lali, and then from you, Osama, as well, on this. I think that's absolutely right. And where you know, the world is quite polarized, when there's evil, there's always good. And evil can be present in many of these horrible conflicts. But as Rania said, the human spirit and, and, and hope, really, and the ability to do good beyond, beyond what surrounds you will, will survive as well. And Osama? Well, humanity is just like an atom that, you know, uh, electrons and protons keep it together. So evil and good exist. Um, as Rania said, when you go into a conflict zone, yes, it is suffering all around you, but it does show you the resilience and the human spirit, the, the ability of humans to come together and move on, come together and come to terms, and then at the end also have a flicker of hope that things would be better. Thank you very much. Please join me in welcoming our panel here.